Welcome back to a, another uh, video where we're going to continue our discussion on money and and just working as a, a professional in the creative space, either as a composer or whatnot. Today, I invite Sky McClay. Sky is a composer, oboist, installation artist, uh, educator. Um, and among many other things. Um, and I'm super excited that she is here. Um, welcome. Thanks, Spencer. I'm really happy to be here. I'll just tell you a bit about myself and where I am at in my life. I would describe myself as a later stage emerging composer in my early 30s. I went to Columbia University for my doctorate and graduated in, in 2018, so five of my most fruitful emerging composer years were spent in New York City. In 2017, I moved to Chicago because my spouse got a great job here, or in Chicago, and then as soon as I finished my doctorate, I got a tenure-track job at Valparaiso University in Northwest Indiana, so that's about 50 miles away from Chicago. And for the first year of my job, we had apartments in both Valparaiso and Chicago and kind of went between them. And then the second year of my job, we moved fully to Valparaiso. But then in um, the summer of 2020, we decided to move back to Chicago. And actually my job at Valparaiso was cut because of budget cuts. So I don't have that job anymore, unfortunately. But I currently have a fellowship at the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination. So that started at the beginning of January in, in Paris. So now we live in Paris until the end of August. And um, we'll probably then move back to Chicago at that point. And I don't know um, if I'll have another job lined up, but I am definitely looking for a new job at this time. Did you know about 80% of the people who watch my videos are not currently subscribed to my channel? Did you also know that about 60% of the people who watch my videos come from some sort of external source like Facebook? So please, if you like my videos, subscribe to my channel. It really helps a lot. If you like the video, like it. It helps with the Facebook algorithm. And finally, if you want to hear something new or if you want to comment on what I something I said, please leave a comment. I try my best to respond to every single comment that I get and whether it's good or bad, and I look forward to hearing from you. you. This community is why I keep doing this, so thank you so much for being a supporter. Okay, so you do a couple different things. I know you, you wear a number of different hats as an artist, and I'm wondering, like, where does your income come from? How do you sustain yourself? Well, this definitely varies year to year, but overall, I would say I make the most money from my teaching jobs, so... Uh, and I'm including in that my graduate school fellowships. So over my doctorate at Columbia, I had a, a fellowship that paid about $30,000 a year, which was great. And also in the summer, I would always teach at a camp called the Walden School, which is an amazing job teaching at this camp for young composers. So that always you know, contributed to my teaching income. And then I've had this job at Valparaiso the past two years where I made about $50,000 each year from that. And then I'd say my second biggest income comes from commissions. And over the past about five years, I've made between $8,000 to $22,000 each of those years from commissions, I would say. Uh, on average, uh, well, I calculated this on over the past five years. On average, I've made about thirteen thousand dollars each year from commissions, and then I also have income streams from ASCAP royalties, from selling my scores, or from my publisher selling my scores, and um, you know that's a pretty small income stream, and then I have sort of one-off things like um, fellowships and prizes, like, well, for example, the fellowship that I have now, I'm not being paid to teach or anything, and I'm not being commissioned for a specific work, it's just they're supporting me to do my work and do great things and saying, you know, we 
trust you and want you to put art into the world. So that's a really amazing, special opportunity for, um, for me this year. Wow. Uh, yeah, and I think that the hearing, all, hearing that, I really appreciate that, like the transparency that, that you've provided for us, because I think that we don't, we don't talk about money. Um, nobody, nobody tells us, you know, what they make. And, um, and I think that uh, it actually, it's making me want to say more about myself. I'm not going to do it right now. I'll do that in a future video. But uh, um, the, and I think that, that the thing I found really interesting about your, the way that you said it is, is how much you thought about your yearly take home pay as opposed to like individual one off projects. Um, I wonder if you could expand on that a little, just a little bit and how you thought about that. Yeah, I definitely think of, about income more as a big picture. And uh, since, since starting my doctorate at Columbia, when I, I knew that for at least five or six years, I would have this sort of base income of, of $30,000, I decided I'm going to try my best to live on that income and then save whatever I make extra in addition to that as um, from commissions and additional teaching and speaking engagements and such. And because I feel like my life as an artist is inherently a bit unstable and unpredictable and so I want to have a lot of savings for uh, for for lean years or for un, under, underemployed years or for even for retirement, you know, maybe I won't even need that money until retirement. And also I want to have a, a sort of pot of savings for big projects for investing in, in my career. Like if I wanted to make a self-funded album, I want to have savings where I could do that even if I didn't get any grants or anything. So, um, I guess I try to have a sort of, well, that's a reason that I definitely value being a professor and want, I want to be a professor again because I really value having that sort of predictable, stable income so that everything on top of that I can um, think, you know, in, save and do other things with. And I definitely want to, you know, maximize my non-teaching income, but I also don't want to um, do so in a way that's unsustainable for me creatively. And so I just have to, uh, you know, do projects that I know I have enough time and creative energy for and hopefully make money from them. But that's usually not my, my primary goal. Yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And um, I think it can be really challenging to, to also, um, when we're thinking about the money aspect of things, but we're also trying to be creative, right? Um, and, and sometimes those, those things don't, don't uh, work together. And it's like, and sometimes they do, and sometimes it works out. But, uh, um, but I think that uh, knowing what your, your working style is important, right? Knowing what you need to, to sustain yourself is important. And it's gonna be different for you than it is for me. And it's gonna be different for, for me than it is for someone else who's watching this. So um, yeah, no, absolutely, I agree. Um, but I know you've mentioned your yearly, like what you make usually yearly, but I'm wondering like when a commissioner um, or a potential commissioner comes to you and you and asks you about rate or how much, you sh how much should this cost? How does that normally, how does that conversation usually happen? Yeah, so for commissions, I, I have a sliding scale that considers a lot of factors. And I actually don't have this written down or set in stone. It's more, um, I just know that it's sliding on a lot of axes. <laughs> and um, one of those factors is uh, the source of the, the funding. So if a group comes to me and says, we want to commission you, I might ask, well, can we apply for a grant? Can we apply for um, funding, outside funding so that we can afford to do this. And so we might apply for things like uh, the big sort of famous commissioning grants like the From, Chamber Music America, the Barlow, um, the Kutsuvetsky, I'm not sure if I pronounced that one right. But these, of course, are super competitive. 
but if you do happen to get one, then it's really amazing. And then that amount of the grant dictates how much I would charge for the project. So like, for example, I, um, my highest paying commission ever was, I was paid $12,000 for um, a reed quintet that was supported by Chamber Music America. And the Chamber Music America Classical, Classical Commissioning Grant has guidelines for the length and durate and um, instrumentation of a piece. That's just what they pay. And it's, I'd say it's very generous. So for that particular project, I used their, um, their pay scale because we got the grant. And um, hooray, that's amazing. It usually doesn't happen that way, but for at least like four times in my life so far, as I, we've gotten something like that that um, a big grant for our commissioning project. And uh, if that doesn't happen, then I would say it really depends on the organization that I'm working with. So like if they're a wealthier organization, I'll expect a higher rate. So in my experience, be, some bigger organizations like the Los Angeles Philharmonic Green Umbrella Series or um, Kronos Quartet, uh, both of those organizations asked me for a piece and they would just tell me the fee up front. And in both cases, it was about $5,000. And um, I was satisfied with that. But one time I knew that my friend had gotten paid $7,000 for doing the same thing pretty much that they were asking me to do and for five thousand dollars and so i said i so i usually wouldn't really try to negotiate that but because i had this information i said like oh but you know my friend was set, paid seven thousand dollars so do you think you could give me more money and in that case they were able to raise it to five thousand five hundred dollars so uh i got five hundred extra dollars just for asking so that worked out I think I would call that a win. Um, and so those are, you know, bigger organizations that have monetary resources. If it's um, a, a similar project that I really want to do with a group that doesn't have much money, I might write a similarly sized piece for $1,000 if that's just what they say, like, this is all we can afford. Um, so I would, uh, it just depends on how much artistically and personally uh, that I want to do the project. And so I try to sort of balance maybe one piece where I get paid a lot in a year with like two piece, one piece where I get a medium amount and one piece where I don't get paid as much just, um, but really want to do it for other reasons. And um, so I'm aiming to be fairly compensated, but I also, don't aspire to make all of my income from commissions because I think that would be too stressful and um, creatively unsustainable for me. So this sort of um, sliding scale approach has worked well for me so far. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think that a lot of people take the similar approach. I would definitely say that's the approach that I take. Uh, I got a you know $3,000 commission um, that was kind of out of the blue from a from an institution like it was not an individual um, and it was definitely my largest commission at the time and I uh, and I didn't even bother negotiating because I was like oh this is the largest commission I've ever had um, and but I also knew that it wasn't a large organization I knew that they they were you know that was the situation um, yeah I, I agree with everything that you said and I think that uh, it's really great advice I'm curious, though, um, I know you talk about your sliding scale, um, and a lot of composers uh, will occasionally write um, pieces for their friends from time to time for free, or, or this is a project that I'm super passionate about. Are there ever times when you take on projects and you don't get compensated for them at this point? Yeah, definitely. I will work for free if I just really, really want to do a project for personal or artistic reasons. Um, or sometimes if it's for a good cause, like for example, I know that we both wrote pieces for the uh, Georgia runoff commissioning project to raise money for the Democratic Senate races in Georgia. Um, so I like to do stuff like that sometimes. And I guess over um, 
I've just tr tried over the past decade to move from sort of like all my writing all my pieces for free to cr gradually crossfade into most of them being paid for most of them, but still not necessarily all of them. Yeah. And I will say like, just for my own opinion, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with doing those passion projects from time to time. If you, and if you see it as a, this is a, I am being supplemented in other projects that I'm doing to cover the things that I really want to do. And in some situations, those passion projects can lead to other things that you don't even expect just because you're putting that extra little bit of, I don't know, there, like there's that extra little passion in there um, that you really want to do. Or be, I've had experiences with like friends where I've written them things and then they play it a ton. And mm -hmm. I, I think that those, those are also really good experiences. Um, yeah, and of course it's also super important to consider the, the professional and artistic benefits that are not monetary that you will gain from something like that. Like any time somebody plays your piece a lot of places. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as we kind of start to finish up, I'm curious, um, what advice do you have for people who are either at the same career level or or uh, who are, or are younger than, than you and myself? One piece of advice I have is to start applying. So, you know, I mentioned applying to, to grants, but the ones that I mentioned are super duper competitive. And so I think it's important to start applying to local and school-based grants and smaller things that have uh, less competitive applicant pools because once you have some success there, it's just a lot easier to build up and apply for bigger things and bigger opportunities. And people will look at your CV and say like, oh, they've already gotten a grant for this thing. So that must mean they should get another one. So it kind of becomes the, the domino effect of, of success. And of course you'll face a lot of rejection too, but that's just part of being a composer and um, another piece of advice is to nurture your true friendships and your art artistic kinships with performers because, uh, you know, that's why we do it in the first place is to build our community and create these magical artistic experiences. So remember to, um, you know, to cherish and nurture those relationships. And I think my last piece of advice is to really lean into what makes your music unique because people notice music that's different and memorable and striking um, even more so than music that has great technique because a lot of people have great technique and you should strive for that but also I think make bold choices with uh, with your personal voice and taking risks because that is I think what makes people really want to work with you is like something really new and different and striking. Uh, so it sounds like you've lived in a, in a few different places um, and I'm sure when you were living in Indiana um, that's a pretty different change from living in a large city um, like New York or, or Chicago um, and now you're living in Paris. Um, I'm curious uh, how maintaining your relationships in your community um, with, with all the different people that you work with has worked uh, not living in one of those big centers. When I lived in Valparaiso, I definitely worked hard to maintain professional relationships when I, especially by traveling to my performances or traveling to festivals and um, just whenever I could going to be there in person when my pieces were being performed. So I definitely did, um, you know, a few trips to New York City. I was in a piece called, um, by Lucia Vitkova, who's a composer that is a good friend of mine that I work with a lot. And so we had like two performances that I needed to go to New York City for. And then I would try to like, you know, see a lot of other people. And um, then, and I also had some gigs in the Midwest that were actually, you know, closer to Valparaiso, Indiana, even than Chicago. So like, for example, um, I worked with students at University of Louisville and uh, had had some pieces performed at that festival. I was in the Bowling Green New Music Festival and um, I did a little residency at Indiana University. So th of course the Midwest is full of places where that are really into new music and a lot of people doing awesome stuff. 
And um, so I tried to work on those connections and also like, for example, my, um, my friends in the duo Wolf Tone came and did a performance at Valparaiso as part of their Midwest tour. So I tried to facilitate, you know, use my position there to create some residencies and have some guests. And so I think my main, the main thing that maybe uh, made it difficult was just that I, I was so busy with my teaching schedule there that it is, you know, I just can't do that much traveling. So um, just trying to squeeze it in when I could and, um, and also keep my connections in Chicago going and be sure to go support my friends' performances in Chicago whenever I could. Yes, the Midwest is awesome. There's lots of things happening here. There's lots of things happening elsewhere also. Like it's, it, the, community, the music community today isn't, doesn't necessarily have to be where you live. Um, that said, you should still get to know the people in the community that you live in um, because you never know what relationships can arise from that. Yeah, and of course I, I definitely loved also building deeper relationships with my, my colleagues at Valparaiso and some of them um, have performed my music and I think they're super awesome. Awesome. Um, well, to finish up, uh, is there anything else that you think people should know about, about this conversation? I think that it's really um, your, uh, your approach to your wealth and income and finances is very personal and there's no sort of wrong way to do it. Making money from non-musical sources is a totally legit way to build a life for yourself and still be an artist and a composer. And also I'm just, I just want to acknowledge that I'm very, uh, you know, very privileged to, for example, not have student loan debt because my family paid for my undergrad. And I think that it's, it's really rough out there for a lot of my students and people who are, you know, young composers coming up like financially. Um, it's, it's not easy to make a living and you just have my love and support. And I'm, I, but I'm just acknowledging that what I'm saying here, my, my financial picture, I know, that it's easier said than done for sure. This was, this was such a brilliant idea to, to have this conversation. Um, and I really appreciate for your idea. Um, so thank you for, for that time. Um, I'm super excited to, to continue engaging with your work. Um, and uh, there will be some links uh, in the description below with where to find things, things that she's working on. Um, and I hope that your uh, residency in Paris is continue or fellowship in Paris rather uh, continues to just go swell. Thank you so much for having me, Spencer. Have a great rest of your evening because you're it's, it's evening there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye. Bye.